All right. Well, uh, brave Shemalites who have come out for today's luncheon, welcome. Uh, it seems that every day we are reminded of some version of the old adage, democracies work and there's no guarantees. Invented by the Athenians, they had a democracy for approximately 40 years before it gave way to an aristocracy and then autocracy. They reinvented it, tried again shortly thereafter, but again with mixed results. About 250 years later, we gave it another shot and have rediscovered how much work democracy actually is. Today we have the privilege of hearing an extraordinary tale of that work involved in understanding and developing what are the principles and practices of democracy in one of its fundamental modern concerns, the separation between religion and the state. Kyrgios Joel is a village in upper New York State that has been successful, uh, has had a successful, if tumultuous, community uh, of, of Satmar Hasidic Jews. Their story presents a conflict of principle, of laws, and as our authors put it, learning how to play the game. Each conflict cuts to the heart of the work of citizens and lawmakers in a democracy. It's a fascinating story that embodies the dynamics and struggles of democracy in which one group's solutions are another's opportunities and a third stands by hating and resisting the change. Our guests today are distinguished both locally and nationally. Nomi Stolzenberg is an author and lawyer who holds the Nathan and Lily Chappelle Chair at the uh, University of South California, Southern California, Gould School of Law. She's also the founder and co-director of the USC Center for Law, History, and Culture. David Myers, whose name you may recognize, <laughs> is her husband and also the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Professor of Jewish History at UCLA and the director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and, P and Policy. As you will see, they are both superb writers and compelling storytellers. So please welcome Naomi Schultzenberg and David Myers. Thank you very much, Hal. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so great to be here back at the Shemmel Forum. Uh, this is our, Nomi's and my first uh, public appearance speaking to a live audience um, in, since, uh, I believe, February 2020. So it's really uh, a special blessing uh, to be amongst you. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk to you about a small Jewish community in upstate New York, uh, which may on the surface of it not seem to be the most compelling subject. But as Hal alluded uh, to in his remarks, this is really a story uh, of much greater proportions. This is a story about democracy, it's a story about religion and state, and to a very great extent, it's a story about America. Um, as I think we will try, we, as we will try to make it uh, abundantly clear. Um, we approach this story uh, through two sets of lenses. We really have, in some sense, blended, even married, our uh, various disciplinary perspectives. So I will approach the story through the lenses of Jewish history, and Nomi will approach the story through the lens of American law and politics. Um, as we think of law, politics, and uh, their opposite, uh, I must say, uh, just as a matter of really moral imperative that uh, I want to express uh, what I think many of us feel, which is our deep solidarity with and sense of concern for the people of Ukraine uh, in the face of such a brutal uh, and relentless assault. 
Um, and there's an irony here, especially through the lens of Jewish history, especially to people attuned to Jewish history, which is that Ukraine has been the site really of the killing fields of millions of Jews. Uh, it also was the site of an extraordinary, vibrant, robust Jewish culture. Um, and in fact, we have begun to see the seeds of the revival of a robust Jewish culture in Ukraine in recent years, in the post-Soviet era. One reflection of that new sense of hope uh, is the fact that Ukraine, once really the bloodlands where millions were slaughtered, now has a Jewish president. And it's a small reminder, even in the midst of the darkness, that the arc of history can sometimes bend towards justice. So I want us to hold on to that possibility, even in the midst of what seems to be such a bleak and desperate situation. Um, Ukraine is relevant uh, in another more immediate regard, and that is that it has been home to a large number of Shtetls, uh, one of the operative terms in our title uh, and in our talk. And so I'm now going to um, advance the slide. Uh, the title of the book that Nomi and I labored almost two decades on is American Shtetl. America, you're familiar with, and the adjectival descriptor you also recognize. Shtetl may be less familiar to you, so um, I want to just uh, conjure up an image for you of what a shtetl is. Um, many of you are familiar with Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof tells the tale of a Jewish family and indeed community in the fictional town of Anatevka. In fact, in recent years, there's uh, been a new community established in Ukraine called Anatevka, so it's no longer just fictional. The, the world conjured up in Fiddler on, on the Roof is of a holistic, organic, traditional Jewish community posed perched really at the brink of dramatic transformation, right, as new ideologies are beginning to enter into the community and transform the younger generation. And the older generation clings desperately uh, to that uh, erstwhile traditionalism. Um, the picture on the left really captures that sense of the traditional world of the, 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 the Jewish shtetl of Eastern Europe. Um, many of which, as you can see on this map, were indeed located in Ukraine. But there's a really um, important distance and difference between the mythic shtetl, that sort of holistic, organic Jewish world, and the way in which shtetls actually operated on the ground in Eastern Europe. Uh, what does the term mean? Well, it is a small Jewish town or village from the Yiddish word shtot, uh, town or village. Shtetl is sort of the diminutive of that. And yet what we know is that shtetlas, the uh, Yiddish plural, or shtetls, were never completely Jewish. They were never uh, completely homogeneous in terms of the religious sensibility, the political orientation, uh, the social class of the Jews in the community was a much more diverse microcosm of Jewish life, very often embedded in or adjacent to a larger non-Jewish population. So the ideal of this completely segregated, homogeneous community of like-minded Jews, if any of you have spent time with a group of Jews, you know they tend not to be like-minded. Um, <laughs> that vision is really a kind of myth. And the historical shtetl is a much more diverse, um, heterogeneous uh, community. And in addition, never did such a community assume the powers of government recognized by the larger state. And that becomes extremely relevant to the story we're about to tell, um, which is the story of a community called Curious Joel, New York. Um, which was envisioned by its founders as indeed a shtetl. But a shtetl that bore closer resemblance to the mythic ideal than to the actual historical reality. Kyrgyz Joel took rise as a shtetl and within a short period of time <coughs> became a legally recognized municipality in the state of New York. And you might ask yourself, 
This happened in the United States of America, where the principle of the separation of church and state is so deeply entrenched. Our answer is, it could only happen in America. It certainly couldn't happen back in the old country, in Europe. Uh, and we'll try and explain why this phenomenon, which seems so rooted in a mythic past, in fact, is very much part of the American present. The community consists now of 33,000 residents, according to the 2020 United States Census, all of whom, with a handful of exceptions, are members of the Satmar Hasidic group. Hasidism is a kind of collection, um, an umbrella term for a number of different groups, all of whom trace their origins back to the teaching of a great late 18th century rabbi known to us as the Baal Shem Tov, who sought to introduce a new degree of piety, a new degree of spiritual fervor into a Judaism that he believed had been deadened largely by an exclusive focus on the study of religious texts, a kind of counterintuitive proposition. But for the Baal Shem Tov, the essence of Judaism uh, dwelt in its uh, experiential qualities, in living and breathing it, not just studying. So Hasidism was a movement of spiritual revival, but also at the same time a, a, a movement of social protest against an elite culture dominated by illustrious learned rabbis. Hasidism sought to empower uh, the Jewish rank and file in the work of a living, vibrant Judaism. From the late 18th century, the Baal Shem Tov's message spread out throughout different parts of Eastern Europe, and in uh, places where the message took hold, usually there was a, a chief interpreter of that message, the chief, the rabbi, but known uh, as the Rebbe, known by, by the sort of Yiddishized version of the term rabbi as the Rebbe, who was very often a charismatic interpreter of the Baal Shem Tov's uh, message. Uh, who was indeed understood to possess very unique powers, very uncommon for uh, Jewish rabbis, except for an interesting rabbi who took rise in the first century in Palestine, which is to say Hasidic rabbis were understood to possess the capacity to communicate uh, with the divine, uh, something that uh, was anathema to many other versions uh, of uh, Jewish religious expression. The Satma group was one of the latest forms of Hasidism. It too had a charismatic Rebbe at the center. Um, and as we will see, that Rebbe had the vision when he came to America of creating uh, a separatist enclave outside of the city where his followers could live their lives according to their own preferred uh, methods. As I said, live according to the path of the ancient Israel. So that enclave was created, and for reasons that we will explain, um, within a few years, it became not just a shtetl, but a legally recognized village, um, known as the village of Kiryas Joel, which means the village of Joel, named after someone we will encounter in a second. And more recently, in 2019, that village became, for all intents and purposes, a town. Um, uh, known as palm tree, which uh, is uh, a name of some significance. It happens to be the English translation of the name Teitelbaum. So keep att pay attention to Joel and Teitelbaum uh, as we move forward. Where is this community? This shtetl, this group of uh, homogeneous Jews that became a legally recognized village. It's about 50 miles north of New York City, uh, located in Orange County. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, are a lot of interpretations about whether this constitutes upstate New York or not. Um, some would say absolutely. Anything north of New York City is by definition upstate. If you live in Syracuse, you may have a different understanding of that question. Um, and as, as I mentioned, the, the community was named after a person named Joel, and the name Palm Tree uh, is a translation for the term Teitelbaum, and this is the dramatic personality at the center of our story the charismatic Rebbe of the Satmar Hasidic group, Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum. Born in East Central Europe, in the northeast quadrant of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1887, scion of a very distinguished Hasidic family, 
from Hungary, uh, which was the incubator of a very fierce form of traditionalist Orthodox Judaism known as Haredi Judaism, uh, a word that means trembling, um, as if one trembles with uh, awe in the presence of God. So intent was one on realizing uh, the vision of understanding the will of God. The Teitelbaum family was, um, was characterized by its commitment to fight against forces of contamination and impurity in the world, and they believed that much of the modern world was indeed a source of contamination and impurity. Life for them in everyday daily existence was life lived in extremis. It was life lived in a state of emergency because of the threats that the modern world uh, presented. Uh, the family and Joel Teitelbaum, uh, the most renowned member of this uh, family, were fierce opponents of all form of innovation, uh, particularly religious innovation, which they said is forbidden as a matter of Torah. Um, and very interestingly, Rabbi Teitelbaum was uh, also perhaps the most renowned and in some circles reviled Jewish opponent of Zionism that the 20th century ever saw. Uh, Rabbi Teitelbaum's opposition to Zionism rested on the proposition that movement, mass movement to the land of Israel by Jews should, should take place only with the coming of the Messiah. That this was an arrogation by human beings of what was explicitly a divine prerogative to commence the process of the coming of the Messiah, which was symbolized by the return to the land of Israel. Um, and Rabbi Tatelbaum uh, fulminated against Zionism uh, throughout his career, and including in two famous Hebrew books, um, which uh, we can discuss further. Um, he established his own community in what had been the Hungarian t uh, town of Satmar, which after 1920, and the sort of the reorganization of the map of Europe following the First World War, now Romania, the Romanian town of Satumari, he himself was elected town rabbi in 1928 in Satumari or Satma, hence the name of the group, but didn't assume office until 1934. And there from 1934 until 1944, he built up his community of followers while also serving as uh, the town rabbi. Hungary is very interesting in many respects. One is because it sort of stood at the crossroads of East and West and thus became such an interesting laboratory for uh, the development of new forms of uh, religious expression like Haredi Judaism. It's also interesting because it was something of an outlier after the ascent to power of Adolf Hitler. Uh, because um, the Hungarian leader, Admiral Horthy, forged um, a kind of uh, accord with Hitler not to invade Hungary and not to uh, deport Hungary's Jews, um, a, an agreement that held up from 1940 until March 19, 1944, when it was discarded, thrown out the door, uh, German forces enter uh, Hungary, and within a matter of three or four months, uh, a large percentage of the Hungarian Jewish population had been deported to concentration or death camps. Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum was not amongst them. He himself, in an interesting twist of historical fate, was saved by a Hungarian Zionist official by the name of Rudolf Kostner. Uh, and indeed, he was one of 1,685 Jews saved by Kostner, um, who entered into negotiations with none other than Adolf Eichmann, the SS uh, uh, officer in charge of Jewish affairs. Um, uh, a, deal was struck and a number of prominent Jews were saved. They made their way first to the concentration camp Bergen-Belsen where they held separately. And then in early December 1944, Joel Teitelbaum was, uh, was liberated to Switzerland where he spent nine months or so. Then he moved to Palestine where he spent uh, about a year. And then he came to the United States uh, uh, on Rosh Hashanah uh, in 1946, the Jewish New Year. He settled in the United States in the uh, uh, Brooklyn neighborhood of Williamsburg, where there already was an established Jewish community, uh, but which he uh, was really the principal force in transforming, especially in North Williamsburg, into a major center of Haredi Judaism. It is the uh, largest concentration of Satra Hasidic Jews now in the world, 75,000, we estimate, in Williamsburg alone. 
Um, he did what he always did when he came to a new community, like when he came to Satmar, Satomari in 1934. He transformed the Jewish community by introducing his own very stringent norms of ritual observance uh, into the community. Um, and he understood that there was an infrastructure in Williamsburg that allowed him to do that. But at the same time, he was deeply mindful of the threats that the city produced that the city posed, all of the allures and seductions of urban life. And he resolved to set up at one point or another a enclave, a safe haven away from uh, the pulsating, throbbing pace of the city. He entrusted that task to his chief lieutenants, and they began a search for a property outside of the city to serve alongside Williamsburg as a center of Satmar Hasidic life. And incidentally, in sort of imagining a place outside of the city of Safe Haven, this was not um, uh, an exclusively Satmar or Jewish vision. It took place in the heart of that massive movement of uh, Americans from cities to suburbs in the 19, late 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Let's see if we can go back. Hmm. Not sure, I think we skipped one, so I'll just go back. Okay, all right. So early attempts were made to find what what uh, what Rabbi Tatenbaum's followers imagined to be a shtetl. Again, think back to that mythic Eastern European model. Um, the first efforts took uh, his followers to uh, Staten Island, uh, then Mount Olive, New Jersey, where there was a bitter battle that took place after. Uh, the uh, officials and residents of Mount Olive, New Jersey, understood that there may be a major invasion, as it were, as they imagined it, of strange-looking and strange-talking Hasidic Jews. And here it's important to note uh, that more than a dose of anti-Semitism was present when Satmar officials, working on behalf of Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, made their way to uh, towns in search of land to purchase. Uh, the Mount Olive project collapsed. Uh, litigation ensued, and that was taken off the table. A number of other attempts were made uh, in uh, upstate New York, um, and in each of those instances, Satmar officials encountered a really unwelcome reception, such that they got smart uh, after the fourth or fifth time and uh, asked the brother-in-law of the Rebbe's chief lieutenant, the chief lieutenant was a man named Leibus Schlefkowitz, and his brother-in-law was a non-observant, clean-shaven Hungarian Jew named Oscar Fischer, who was given the task of purchasing property on behalf of the Satmar community, which he did in 1972 uh, in uh, uh, Orange County, New York, in the town of Monroe. For two years, the Satmar community, uh, closely associated with, with Rabbi Tadeldbaum, um, began to develop that uh, property in uh, the town of Monroe, uh, very surreptitiously, without tipping their hand as to who were the intended re uh, residents of this new uh, of this new place. And in the summer of 1974, the, the first Satmar residents began to move from Brooklyn, from Williamsburg, to this uh, new safe haven in uh, in suburban New York. What ensued from that point forward were two very bitter years uh, of disputation and contestation between the Satmar residents and uh, both officials and residents of the town of Monroe, um, uh, especially over zoning regulations. What was the definition of a single family home? Right? Was it a home in which 18 people lived, um, as was not uncommon in Satmar families? Uh, was it permissible to have um, a kindergarten or a ritual bath or a matzo bakery in the basement of a garden apartment? These were the questions that were uh, at, the, at the heart of the disputes between uh, the Satmar residents uh, uh, and town officials of Monroe. And at the point that it seemed like uh, litigation over religious discrimination in federal court was to take place, uh, and a deal was hatched in a late night meeting one Saturday night, October 23, 1976, to create within the town of Monroe a, an autonomous village 
to be known as Curious Joel that would have the ability to regulate its own zoning affairs. Part of the drama in our story is that it's pretty easy to create a village of your own in the state of New York. You basically need, as uh, the law on the right says, 500 residents um, who don't occupy more than five square miles. And with enough private property and a degree of discipline and homogeneity, you can create a village of your own. And that's, in fact, what happened uh, in 1976 and then was officially authorized by then uh, Secretary of State of New York, Mario Cuomo, in March 1977. What had been a shtetl, uh, a, a place of spiritual refuge, had become now a legally recognized municipality uh, in the state of New York. Um, there are many indicators of the success of this community, not just in establishing itself, but ever since. And perhaps the foremost measure of success is the astonishing growth of the community. Certainly the fast of, fastest growing community in the state of New York and in some decades in the United States. So the community began with 2,000 residents according to the 1980 uh, census, and there are 33,000 residents in the year 2020. There's a 62% growth in the population from 2010 to 2020. So according to that measure, especially for a community whose ranks were depleted during the Holocaust, uh, some 75% of uh, the Jewish population of Satumari, of Satmar, was, uh, was deported and murdered uh, in uh, concentration death camps. The imperative to replenish the ranks uh, is front and center. Not only is there massive population growth, but there's a tremendous degree of homogeneity. Almost everybody in this community is a Satmar Hasidic Jew, very unlike the actual historical shtetl of yore, where you had a wide range of Jews, observant, not observant, left, right, rich, poor, not so much in Kiris Joel. Everybody is a Samar Hasidic Jew, and the overwhelming majority of people speak the Yiddish language um, every day of their lives from cradle to grave. 96% uh, of the community declared that uh, they spoke a language other than English at home, um, which we can safely assume to be Yiddish. Uh, education is taken very seriously. There's a very uh, rich network of private religious uh, schools in the community. But as you will see, virtually no one goes to university, which is in many respects the reverse of the American Jewish profile outside of the community, where university attendance is amongst the highest of any group in uh, American society. Uh, this is a community that adheres very carefully to both uh, gender norms, uh, excuse me, uh, modesty norms, um, and um, a, a high degree of gender separation. Um, some of you perhaps have seen the sign that greets visitors who come to Curious Joel, uh, which enjoins all to observe, the, observe those modesty laws and maintain gender separation, as you see in the third line. Um, and another, and this is deemed by the community, the sort of uniform adherence to these norms is deemed very much a measure of success. Um, one might also add uh, the fact that not only uh, has this community managed to achieve homogeneity and population growth, but it can regulate its own affairs by virtue of the fact that it is also um, a self uh, a self-operating municipality. It has a self-regulating government, it has a mayor, it has a village board, it has a school board, it even has, as we will hear, a public school in its midst uh, for reasons that uh, require a bit more explanation. Um, we might say this is outrageous and there's no such thing that has ever taken rise in the United States. <laughs> the fact of the matter is this kind of phenomenon of a separatist strong form of religious sub-community is deeply rooted in the history of the United States. Um, we can think of many examples extending back to the original European uh, settlers who came to the United States. Think of John Winthrop and the Massachusetts Bay Colony and his vision of creating a city on the hill, very much informed by uh, his religious ideals. Or think of perhaps the most successful example of this kind of religious communitarianism, as we call it, Religious communitarianism, not as a result of state-sponsored or state-validated uh, 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 validation, but bottom-up, right? Um, 
buying property, settling the land, and creating out of that a politically recognized uh, entity. Think of the, perhaps the most successful instance of this bottom-up religious communitarianism, uh, the Mormons, who first established um, their own municipality in Illinois in a city called Nauvoo, then as a result of conflict with local residents and federal officials, made their way westward to the territory of Utah, where in Salt Lake City they created uh, a new enclave, which ultimately became a state of its own, the state of Utah. There are many other examples. The one on the right is of a community of followers of an Indian guru who established their own city in rural Oregon called Rajneeshpuram around the same time that Curious Joel was taking rise, such that the phenomenon of such an entity, of a shtetl that becomes a municipality, uh, of bottom-up communitarianism is not unique to the Sapra case. Uh, there are other Hasidic municipalities, uh, shtetls that became their own self-regulating uh, uh, bodies in neighboring Rockland County, in uh, New Square and Kaser, uh, uh, in the town uh, uh, of uh, Ramapo. But, and with this I'm moving to the end of my uh, presentation, then Nomi will take over. Not All is not well um, in the community, uh, notwithstanding all those indicators of growth and notwithstanding the fact that this community really belongs to a long tradition uh, of religious communities, uh, strong forms of religious community in the United States. Um, the trouble really begins uh, when the founding charismatic rabbi of uh, Curious Joel and the Satmar dynasty, Joel Teitelbaum, dies in 1979, leaving behind no heirs. Um, the only available candidate is uh, his nephew, uh, with whom he was not particularly close, and interestingly, whom his wife disliked intensely. Uh, and this is relevant to our story because um, the widow of Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, known as the Rebetzin, uh, her name was Alta Faiga, Old Faiga, um, actually uh, took up um, her opposition to uh, Moses Teitelbaum, to Moshe Teitelbaum, uh, after he was appointed the second Sapper rabbi. Um, around her assembled a group of dissidents who believed that they were adherents to the true way of Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum and found in his nephew a pretender to the throne. And already from this early time in the early 1980s, we have um, a fissure within this previously unified community. That fissure uh, uh, develops into many other fissures um, as a result of uh, a number of very contentious uh, uh, d questions that took rise, developments in the community, including uh, the question of whether a public school district should be created within the community. For what purpose? To serve the special needs children of the community who could not be adequately uh, served uh, in the private religious school, uh, school system. Uh, this became uh, a deeply contentious issue both within the community and without, and it ultimately made its way up to the United States Supreme Court in indication of uh, the uh, disagreements that abounded within the community and around it. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to hand things over to Nomi, who will continue to pick up the story. So David has told the, the origin story of Curious Y'all, or KJ, as it's oftentimes referred to, set in the context um, of European Jew Jewish history, going all the way back to its origins um, in Europe. But the Sommer story, as David has already said, is as much an American story as it is a Jewish story. It's a story about changes that were occurring in American society and struggles over the meaning of America's foundational principles that were occurring just at the time when the village was being formed. Two changes in particular proved to be particularly propitious for the Sotler's separatist project. First, over the course of the 1970s and 1980s, America was undergoing a retreat from its commitment, such as it was or is, to integration. 
in hindsight, the period in which integrationism was dominant uh, appears to have been short-lived. The 1954 decision of Brown versus Board, in which segregation was denounced, was immediately greeted with widespread resistance, not only from white segregationists and a broader population of white parents who objected to busing and other strategies for desegregating schools, but also from black nationalists who perceived early on that desegregation would prove to be what has been called the hollow hope so by the mid-1970s, or the early 70s, when the Sotmer settlement of Monroe was just getting off the ground, the proposition that separate is inherently unequal was being roundly rejected by groups on both the right and the left. The revival of interest in cultural pluralism and communitarianism in the 1970s and 80s soon followed by the emergent discourse of multiculturalism and the politics of difference uh, in the early 90s, these were ample evidence of liberal and left-wing sympathy for separate self-governing communities. While the Reagan era romance with localism um, and the popularity of uh, Robert Nozick's widely read Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which became a kind of libertarian Bible, reflected the ascendance of this vision on the right. This dovetailed with a second major shift in American culture, the retreat from another core principle of American liberalism, namely the principle of separation between church and state. That too was a principle of relatively recent vintage. The axioms that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment requires the removal of religion from the public realm and especially from public education, and the denial of public funding to private religious schools were the products of mid-20th century Supreme Court decisions that didn't begin until the late 1940s and really only crystallized in the school prayer decisions of the early 1960s which sparked a backlash as intense as the resistance to racial desegregation, producing the coalition of conservative Catholics and Protestant evangelicals that emerged under the banner of the moral majority in the late 1970s. Their view of the principle of separation between religion and state was widely shared and clearly stated by none other than William Rehnquist, who in the 1985 case of Wallace versus Jaffrey, handed down one year before he became the Chief Justice, he had been an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court since 1972, wrote a dissenting opinion asserting, quote, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history, which has proved useless as a guide to judging, and concluding that quote, it should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. By the early 1990s, it looked like the court might be ready to do just that. And the perfect vehicle appeared to be a case by the name of Grummet versus Board of Education of the Village of Curious Joel. Uh, you see an illustration of, uh, not sure if that's uh, the Supreme Court opinion in that case on the left. Um, a case which in 1993, after already three years of state court litigation, was heading to the United States Supreme Court. That case involved a challenge to the constitutionality of a law enacted in 1990 by the New York State Legislature permitting the village to establish its own school district and thus to secede from the regional school district of which it had formerly been a part. The motivation behind this law arose from an even earlier legal controversy sparked in 1985 when the United States Supreme Court handed down a pair of decisions declaring that it was unconstitutional to provide state funded and administered educational services to children in, in parochial schools. Now those cases specifically addressed not special education but remedial education services which were provided to children from low income and non-English speaking families as part of Johnson's war on poverty. 
Because these services are publicly funded and administered by local school districts, the court reasoned, it violated the Establishment Clause, that's the clause in the First Amendment that prohibits state support for religion, for school districts to provide these services to children inside religious schools. Those cases didn't specifically address special education, which became legally mandatory in 1975, but their reasoning seemed clearly to imply that programs providing publicly funded and administered services to children with special needs were unconstitutional as well. Now, as it turned out, those 1985 decisions represented the apex of the court's commitment to the principle of strict separation between religion and state. Twelve years later, in 1997, the Supreme Court would reverse its position on this issue, declaring that school districts can provide these states, these services to parochial school students. But in 1985, Curious Joel needed to find a way to educate its children with special needs that did not run afoul of the recently announced judicial ban on delivering those services inside religious schools. A brief and unhappy experiment with sending a few soccer children to the regional public schools had led their parents to conclude that it was psychologically traumatic for them and inimical to their children's educational interests to be in such a culturally alien environment. For four years, they battled with the regional school district over a proposal to establish so-called neutral sites, sites that would be neither in the public schools nor in the community's religious schools. <laughs> where special education could be delivered. But in the face of the school district's refusal and insistence that the Sotmer children attend the public schools, the Sotmers turned to their friends in the legislature to help come up with a solution. Now, the idea of creating a separate school district for the Sotmers was not the Sotmers' idea. In fact, they initially resisted it. It came from a then unknown politician the former mayor of Peekskill, who had just been elected to his first term as a state assemblyman, George Pataki. From his days as mayor, he was familiar with the proposal that had been kicking around among mayors of small cities to allow small cities to have their own school districts <clears throat> for reasons having nothing to do with religion or separatist subgroups. This nonetheless struck Pataki as a useful way of resolving the conflict between the Sotmers and the regional school district, which by this point was at least as eager to wash its hands of the Sotmers as the Sotmers were to be done with it. All the interested parties agreed that it was in everyone's interest for Curious Joel to have its own local school district. Except for a man by the name of Louis Grummet, a protege of Mario Cuomo, who had recently finished a term as assistant commissioner for the New York State Department of Education, where he had been in charge of the office in charge of implementing the new special education law. He now served as director of the New York State School Boards Association. Gromit, <clears throat> a dyed-in-the-wool liberal, was aghast at the prospect of a separate school district for the Somers and could not believe at first that his longtime mentor and liberal hero, now the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, would countenance it. When Cuomo informed him he not only would sign the bill the legislature had just passed, but that he strongly approved of it, Gromit went to court and sued. And he continued to sue, that was in 1990, for the entire rest of the decade. As the decision handed down by the Supreme Court in 1994 only marked the midpoint of <clears throat> nearly 10 years of litigation, which ultimately resulted in neither a clear repudiation of the wall of separation, <clears throat> nor in its affirmation, nor did it result in a conclusive determination of the KJ School District's constitutionality Though, thanks to an early ruling from Justice Thomas on what we now would call the shadow docket, 
the school district was permitted to remain in operation pending the outcome of the litigation. Thanks to that ruling, from the day the KJ Public School opened its doors in 1990 until the present, it has never been required to shut down. Now, this might seem surprising given the much heralded Supreme Court decision declaring the statute that Governor Cuomo had signed into law to be unconstitutional. But that was just the first statute. The grounds on which the Supreme Court found that statute to be unconstitutional were quite narrow. Rather than hold that it is unconstitutional for a religiously homogeneous community to establish its own school district, a proposition the court explicitly rejected, the court held that the problem with the first statute was just that it singled out one and only one religiously homogeneous co community to be the recipient of this considerable privilege. So long as the state standards for education are adhered to, the court said, there's nothing wrong with having a religiously homogeneous population with, with uh, have its own school district so long as every religiously homogeneous community with a similar need to opt out of the regional school district has the same opportunity. So following this logic, uh, after this decision, the New York legislature lost no time, indeed it was a matter of days, uh, before it passed a new statute authorizing or reauthorizing the KJ school district. This time, in this law, it avoided singling out Curious Joel by name. Instead, the new law stated that any subunit of a regional school district that met certain maximum population requirements and tax base requirements could choose to form its own school district, just as one could choose to form one's own village. The ensuing litigation Grummet kept challenging the statutes that the New York State Legislature kept passing to reauthorize the KJ School District, revolved around the question of whether the new statute was still singling out the Sotmers for favor, but simply concealing its favoritism behind a, a, a veneer of neutral criteria, a false veneer. If it was, then, under the court's announced principle that it's unconstitutional to only grant one religious community the right to have its own school district, the new statute would be found unconstitutional. On the other hand, if other communities besides Curious Joel could satisfy the criteria, thereby proving that the Sommers weren't being singled out, that raised the chilling specter, chilling to liberal integrationists, that is, of wealthy white communities withdrawing from socioeconomically mixed regional school districts and forming their own separate school districts. For folks like Lewis Grummet, who brought this lawsuit, the lead plaintiff in that litigation, and many others of his ilk, this was the nightmare scenario that the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Establishment Clause as imposing a no singling out requirement rather than a no separatist school district requirement, would go hand in hand with the facilitation of racial and socioeconomic residential and school segregation. The no singling out principle that the Supreme Court adopted in the case of Grummet versus Curious Joel School District was anathema to adherence of the principle of strict separation between religion and state, precisely because it allowed the Sotmers to secede from the regional school district and form a district of their own so long as other subgroups, religious or non-religious, could do the same thing. That no singling out principle went a long way towards satisfying Christian and other religious conservatives who we have seen wanted the court to put an end to the principle of strict separation. But it didn't go all the way. It did not amount to the full-scale denunciation of the wall of separation idea that Chief Rehnquist had called for in 1985, and that many conservative Christian organizations had hoped the court would issue in the Grummet case. Newly formed Christian advocacy organizations had seen in the plight of the Sotmer children with special needs a sympathetic case 
that might finally persuade the court, presided over now by just Justice Rehnquist, to overturn its decisions in which it had declared public support for religious education to be unconstitutional. Perhaps the most notable of these conservative civil liberties organizations, as they like to refer themselves, was the American Center for Law and Justice, or the ACLJ, um, very self-consciously uh, patterned on the ACLU, which was established by Pat Robertson in 1990 and led by a man by the name of Jay Sekulow, uh, a Messianic Jew, today best known uh, as a, a televangelist and uh, one of President Trump's last remaining personal lawyers. Um, back then, Sekulow was a, largely unknown, but he had already scored the religious rights first legal victory in a case requiring school districts that allow community groups uh, to use public school facilities after hours to grant the same opportunity to religious groups, the no singling out principle. Sekulow would go on to have a hand either as lead attorney or as writer of influential amicus briefs in virtually every significant free exercise and establishment clause case and many free speech cases as well, cases which together uh, shifted the court's interpretation of the First Amendment dramatically to the right. But in 1994, when the Sotmar case went up to the Supreme Court, it was still in the early stages of the battle. Rehnquist's position that the principle of separation between religion and state was not really in the Constitution had become axiomatic among religious conservatives, but on the court, it was still a minority position supported only by Justices Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas. The no singling out principle, by contrast, constituted a kind of halfway position between the principle of strict separation between religion and state and a direct repudiation of the principle. And it created, its adoption created a constitutional climate that was ultimately exceedingly hospitable to the Sotmer's religious separatist project. Now that case was hardly the Sotmer's only foray into the American legal system. Indeed, at just the same time that the controversy over special education first began to develop in the mid 1980s, the event that dramatically increased the internal political dissension in, inside the village took place namely the appointment of Moshe, the new Rebbe's, eldest son, Aaron, to be the chief rabbi of Curious Joel. Already in the late 1980s, uh, as David referred to the initial resistance to the acceptance of Moshe, the circle of supporters who had clustered around the Rebbitzin, the, the, the first Rebbe's widow, they had initiated court proceedings proceedings designed to establish uh, title and control over valuable real estate assets in both Brooklyn and Curious Joel. The Sotmer establishment had retaliated by expelling them from the congregation, denying them access to the cemetery, and suing them for wrongfully conveying title to properties that the congregation claimed rightfully belonged to it. The widow's supporters had retaliated in turn by filing more lawsuits, alleging that they were subjected, being subjected to religious discrimination in violation of civil rights ordinances that prohibited, for example, denying access to cemeteries on the basis of religion. Those lawsuits were just the beginning. As opposition to Moshe and Aaron widened into a full-blown dissident movement inside the village, the conflict intensified moving from the streets to the synagogue and increasingly to courts of law, especially after the school district was established, which the dissidents seized upon as a new basis for grievance uh, against the establishment, um, uh, claiming that it was a symbol of the establishment's willingness to traffic with the secular world, accept secular education, and exercise secular powers of government in accord with the requirements of secular law. 
By the turn of the century, numerous lawsuits had already been brought pitting the dissidents against Aaron and the village leadership. And when more conflict erupted between the Aronis and the, the, the followers of Aaron and his brother, who was installed as chief rabbi of Brooklyn, the so-called followers of Aaron, the Aronis, and the followers of his brother Zalman, the Zalis, at the end of the 1990s, yet another round of litigation ensued, lasting for more than a decade and a half, spanning multiple courtrooms, jurisdictions, all told, there were dozens of lawsuits employing legions of lawyers, including some of the most renowned and reputable lawyers in the country, and a few disreputable ones. <laughs> <clears throat> now, this volume of litigation is particularly remarkable because the Sotmans profess to be committed to the traditional Jewish principle that internal disputes should never be brought before Gentile courts. Rather, they maintain or profess to maintain that internal disputes should be adjudicated by rabbinical courts in accordance with Jewish law. Now, time is too short even to begin to summarize all the strands of this tangled skein of litigation, which took literally years to unravel. So one case, um, not even the case over there, um, but a related case on the right side, may suffice to at least indicate the complexities of the Sotmer's legal positions and of the position of American law vis-a-vis -vis the Sotmer's and their separatist institutions. This particular case, which is the last thing I'm going to share with you, it was not the first case to seek an adjudication of the internal political conflicts by a secular court, and it was far from the last, but it was arguably the most fateful. How am I doing on time? How much longer do we have? Okay. So, filed under the name of the dissident congregation known as Chal Haraynim, this was a lawsuit that began as a simple dis zoning dispute, uh, a challenge to a stop order that was issued against a single construction project, um, a, a conversion of a private dwelling into what the dissidents envisaged would become their own grand synagogue. Except that nothing is simple in Curious Joel, um, especially when it comes to matters of law. The heart of that zoning dispute concerned a curious provision of the village's zoning ordinance, which directed that challenges to building code citations be adjudicated not by a court of law, the usual process, but by the village, by the village board of trustees, in other words, by the village leaders. What began as a challenge to that provision of the zoning ordinance eventually morphed into a literal federal case masterminded by a civil rights attorney by the name of Michael Sussman. Some of you may know, if you saw the miniseries Show Me a Hero, you may recognize him as the NAACP lawyer who, who sued the city of, Honker, uh, of Yonkers in its famous uh, housing desegregation case. Like Gromit, Sussman was an American-born descendant of Jewish immigrants who saw the goings-on in Curious Joel through the lens of the civil rights movement, and particularly the fight against racial segregation. Although a generation younger than Gromit, Sussman understood his NAACP colleagues' sense that time would perhaps be better spent on black empowerment than on the hope, the hollow hope of desegregation. In the Yonkers case, however, he nonetheless felt duty bound to challenge um, its blatant efforts to thwart school desegregation. And he there devised a legal strategy designed to present the systemic nature of race, race discrimination um, in the city of Yonkers. So when less than a decade later, KJ's dissidents turned to him to mount a legal challenge to, to the village building ordinance, he saw their plight in similar terms. He saw them, he saw the dissidents as a minority being subjected to systemic discrimination by a municipality. Um, and he sought to present evidence of 
um, denials of public housing units to KJ dissidents by the local public housing authority, which happened to be run by the very same man who presided over the village building ordinance, um, the selective uh, enforcement of the zoning ordinance against the dissidents, selective grants of tax exempt status to properties that housed religious congregations, all of these um, allegations sought, Sussman thwart, sought to thread together to support his claim that the dissidents were being subjected to systemic discrimination by the village. One problem with this argument is that it wasn't clear that the dissidents were a religious minority. Indeed, in the earlier cases challenging their um, denial of access to the cemetery, uh, courts had held that the dispute between the dissidents and the establishment was political and not religious in nature, and therefore the dissidents could not be said to have been subjected to discrimination on the basis of religion in violation of civil rights laws. And here too, the dissidents might have had a tough road convincing a jury that they were a persecuted religious minority rather than the, dis the disgruntled political faction, which is what the lawyers for uh, the village maintained. Um, however, at a crucial point in the trial, this is the rare case that actually went to trial, Sussman, the lawyers for the dissidents, switched gears when the deputy mayor of the village, Abe Weeder, admitted on the stand that the reason for the curious provision of the local of the village ordinance requiring zoning disputes to be submitted for adjudication by the village board of trustees was because of the Sotmer's religious prohibition on taking internal disputes to secular courts. Upon hearing that testimony, the judge presiding over the case, whose name, Jed Rakoff, might be familiar to some of you, indicated he had just been appointed to the federal bench. He indicated his receptivity to the theory that this constituted a subordination of secular government to religious law in violation of the Establishment Clause. In other words, a violation of the principle of separation between religion and state. Now, we have no way of knowing how Judge Rakoff uh, would have actually ruled on that issue, uh, or if he would have let the jury decide that issue rather than um, directing the verdict, as he did in a case in which he was recently in the news involving Sarah Palin. Um, because as soon as the village leaders heard Judge Rakoff opine about the Establishment Clause problems he perceived to be raised by Deputy Mayor Weeder's testimony, they called for a settlement negotiation. And the fateful decision made by the dissidents against the advice of their counsel, Michael Sussman, was to accept a private settlement in which they agreed to drop their lawsuit against the village in exchange for a financial settlement, an agreement on the part of the village to allow them to complete the construction of their synagogue, an agreement that turned out itself to be rather hollow since it was contingent on satisfying building and safety standards that the building department said they failed to meet, um, a further disagreement on the part of the village to make records of its proceedings public, or at least public to the, dissent, to the dissidents, and last but not least, a critical provision of the settlement the parties agreed to was the dissidents agreed to submit all future disputes with the establishment faction to arbitration by the rabbinic courts and not to go to secular court. Well, that settlement immediately broke down, and within weeks, both sides were back in court, each accusing the other of violating the terms of the settlement and seeking permission from the judge to resume litigation. The supposedly halakhic obligation not to sue in secular court, which was now grounded in a judicially enforced settlement, was honored in the breach over and over again, sometimes by the village leaders, but with great frequency by the dis dissidents who have continued to sue the village, pressing the core claim that had crystallized in the course of the Khal Haraidin trial, namely, these are the terms that their lawyer Sussman has now used in repeated complaints, that the village is nothing less than a theocracy 
in violation of the Establishment Clause and the principle of separation between religion and state that had become sacrosanct to them. But every time, this is the last slide here, and I'll finish my remarks, every time the dissidents filed a new lawsuit pressing this claim, they were met with the same response from Judge Rakoff. I believe so, if I'm looking at it. Yes, here it is, if I can get my little pointer to go. Uh, can't get the pointer, here it is. Every time, right, the district court, that's Judge Rakoff, every time they filed a new lawsuit, the Judge Rakoff said, race judicata. That's law Latin for, this issue has already been adjudicated. Because the dispute had been settled, because the dissidents had accepted the settlement, Judge Rakoff ruled over and over, over the course of lawsuits that continued to be brought for years, it couldn't be relitigated. Even though Sussman, representing the dissidents, uh, maintained they were bringing fresh claims, uh, Rakoff deemed them to be the same old conflict in new clothing and didn't allow them to proceed. Um, so what do we learn <laughs> from these um, lawsuits that uh, have ended in the absence of definitive, conclusive judicial pronouncements, either about the constitutionality of the law authorizing the creation of the village or the claims that the village is a theocracy. Well, the lessons are complex, um, certainly too difficult to summarize. For that, you can read the book. Um, but we can say this in closing. And let me see if I can, David, you wanna just get to the last slide? First of all, they show us a legal system and a society, American society, that is as divided and polarized as the Sommers. They show that, as embodied in a figure like Judge Rakoff, notwithstanding the waning commitment to the ideals of integration and strict separation between religion and state that I described in my opening remarks. An ongoing belief in those liberal ideals animated many of the decisions, including the decisions not to decide the cases, right? There was, in fact, a battle going on in this time period, and it's still going on, between adherents of those liberal ideals and opponents of them on both the left and the right. And indeed, I think we can say that that ambivalence over those ideals is internal to the philosophy of American liberalism to which many judges on the courts continue to subscribe. At the same time, and this is the last slide and my last point, we do see clear signs of the rising influence of the conservative political movement and the conservative legal movement, not least in the encouragement of private settlements, right? This was one of the uh, great main policy achievements of the Reagan era. Um, to prefer private arbitration over judicial adjudications of conflicts between private parties. That was a policy um, aggressively promoted by the business wing of the conservative movement um, and promoted by not only the Reagan administration but succeeding uh, administrations as well, and under the aegis of private ar arbitration, religious courts have been authorized and encouraged to resolve disputes. Um, so we can see how these changes in American legal culture are conducive to the Sotmers separatist project, even when there are some Sotmers seeking the court's help in resisting some of the forms that project took. We can also see the role that the Sotmers and the idea of the shtetl that they so materially embody have played in the American legal and political imagination, in particular, the conservative legal imagination. So consider this address delivered by Lewis Powell less than a year before he was appointed to the bench. Many of you I wager are familiar with uh, the so-called Powell Memo, which appears on uh, uh, the right now, I see it moved, um, 
which was an address to the Chamber of Commerce that Powell gave um, in 1971, the year before he was appointed to the bench, which is widely regarded as having laid out the blueprint for the conservative movement. Um, and it was chiefly focused, as you can see, it really represented the business wing of the conservative moment, um, the idea that America's system of free enterprise is under assault, um, and that the, the, the mission was to combat that, um, which was done so very successfully. Less familiar to people is an address to a congregation of American lawyers. I realize it's hard to read this. Um, we print it here. It says, Mr. Justice Powell delivered the prayer breakfast address in San Francisco to a large congregation of American lawyers and their families. Uh, this is before the national prayer breakfast had become a thing that presidents do. That occurred in the 80s. Um, but that all of this was the product of a prayer breakfast um, movement. Um, and here, this is the same year that, that, that Powell gave his actually then secret address to the Chamber of Commerce, laying out um, the blueprint for rescuing America's free enterprise system from socialists and communists. That same year, at this prayer breakfast, he invokes, quote, the sense of belonging. These are his words portrayed nostalgically in the film Fiddler on the Roof, the film version of the show that debuted on Broadway, um, had just come out that year. Those who saw it will remember the village of Anatevka in the last faint traces of sunset on Sabbath Eve. And then he goes on after this sort of lavish description to talk, to say, sadly, this is not the portrait of contemporary American life. So what we see here is that the imaginary shtetl had become an emblem for the conservative movement that fused together its business and social conservative wing. The Sautners benefited from the erosion of the commitment to the ideals of integration and strict separation between religion and state and the commitment to private settlements of disputes. But they not only were the beneficiaries of these changes, they also played an important role in bringing these changes about. Okay. We're open to questions. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, at this point, there have been two generations uh, who have been raised in that school system in Curious Joel. And my question is, if most of them don't attend college, uh, is this sustainable for them? Where do they work? Do they pay taxes? Um, do they leave? Do they rebel? It's, uh, they have been indoctrinated within their own um, religious area there. Do they ever want to break away? Or if they stay, financially, is it sustainable? Well, that's a very, very good question. Um, this is a poor community. In the 2010 census, Kyrgyz Joel was the poorest community in America, 60.1% below the poverty line. Uh, that number has dropped to about 45% in the 2020 a census, which indicates um, a rising middle class within the community, but still high rates of poverty. And it should be noted that um, you can earn sixty or seventy thousand dollars and fall below the poverty line if you have somewhere between ten and fifteen children, which is not uncommon in the community. Is it sustainable? Well, the rate of growth would suggest it's highly sustainable. Um, a sixty-two percent uh, growth in population over a decade is is quite astonishing, and According to uh, various demographic projections, the community will be anywhere from 75,000 to 150,000 by the year 2040 at its current rate of growth. Um, that said, there is a small and we suspect rising number of people who leave the community because they find it uh, not only difficult, but um, impossible, even suffocating, to dwell within the strictures of the community. Uh, that's a very small percentage of the overall population. 
what we see really in that sense are two vectors moving in opposite directions. We see ongoing growth within the community at a rather astonishing clip, and uh, a growing number of people exiting the community um, who no longer feel they can stay within its uh, confines. Mm -hmm. A key factor here is access to the internet. The internet has sort of cracked open uh, the world. It has sort of eviscerated borders that once existed. Um, and for a small, but I think rising number of people, access to the outside world via the internet um, has been a really, in a certain sense, a pathway out. I suspect that as we move forward, um, we're going to see both of those vectors uh, fortified. Um, both a, a larger number of people leaving, and in a certain sense, in response to that, in a response to the threat of the dissolution of the community, a growing commitment to populate within. You also asked about economics. This is definitely a community that pays taxes. Uh, there's, it's not a community of freeloading welfare cheats as sometimes is depicted. That is an unfair, sort of very one-dimensional representation. Um, it's a community in which men, unlike in other Khari uh, uh, sub-communities, do work. Um, uh, they are called upon to work. That was indeed an important uh, imperative of Joel Teitelbaum, that men in the community work. An increasing number of women work, even though they spend a very large percentage of their time giving birth to children. Procreation is considered a really sacred mission. Um, the largest employer in town is the private school district. Uh, about a quarter of the community exits uh, to go into New York City uh, to uh, work there. Um, and an uh, inequal number of people work in very small businesses uh, around town. Um, what, suge what this suggests is a high um, standard of living is not necessary in to sustain uh, large families. Um, and as as, as far as I can project, um, I see nothing shattering the model, uh, suggesting that the community will become less sustainable over the next quarter century. Um, have you had any reaction from Curious Joel to your work, to your book? And if you have, could you tell us what kind of reaction you've had? Yeah. So a large, probably the, you know, the overwhelming majority of people in the community would have no interest in the book. Um, it would um, reflect, you know, a perspective that just wouldn't be of much interest to them. And aren't supposed to read secular literature. But there is within the community, um, I mean, here's what's important to state. People are people. Satma Hasidim are people. Some are curious, some are less curious. Some are, you know, avid readers, some are less avid readers. We've encountered many people interested not just in their community and its, uh, its, its success, but in our perspective on the community. Uh, so there are definitely people who were very interested in what brings us to study this community. And a number of them have read the book. Um, and I was playing for Nomi um, almost on a nightly basis. The, voice messages of uh, someone whom I spent a good deal of time with, um, who's a very keen reader of sort of the proscribed secular literature, who said, uh, you know, I've read 77 pages. Really like it so far. Uh, I'm up to 150. I'm not sure about what you said on page 123, but you know, um, night after night. Um, and the general, look, it's kind of a Rorschach test. It depends where you line up. Um, within the politics of Curious Joel. If you're with the establishment, you'll have one view. And if you belong to one of the dissident factions, you'll have another. Um, for the most part, the reaction we've gotten from within has been very positive. They've also pointed out a couple of, a number of mistakes we've made. Not a huge number, but a number of mistakes, which very interesting, you know, we, we got an email that said something like, you know, I have just read your extraordinary book. There are a number of extraordinary mistakes in it that we're we'll paying attention to. Number one, uh, this man's name is not Benjamin, it's Ben Sion, right? Things like that. Um, you know, a name is very meaningful. Um, so uh, we have gotten reactions like that. That's sort of very granular and very grand. 
and I'm really looking forward to it, actually working with uh, someone who I know, whom I know from the community, to doing a book talk in the community, um, or outside of the community, but with people from Curious Joel in Williamsburg. Um, and that would be a really interesting, exciting uh, proposition. We're waiting to hear what sort of the establishment uh, uh, leadership thinks. They have the book, they're reading it, and we'd really like to know. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much yeah. for your presentation, both of you. When you talk about the people uh, of Furious Joel, it reminds me of the Pennsylvania Amish people. And I'm wondering if, if the people in your book, do they intermarry only among people in the group, or do they leave the group to marry? And as a result, do they have children that are disabled because of the relationship of the people in the, in the community? Yeah, I'll take the first part of that. Um, so there's a high degree of endogamy within the community. Um, and it has long been assumed that there uh, is a high rate of a higher rate of birth defect within the community as a result of that. Um, that that um, data point is disputed by a number of people in the community, especially by those who run the public school, which deals with special needs kids alone who argue on the basis of their own statistical analysis that there's not a significantly higher rate of uh, birth defect in the community. Um, others have suggested that if, there, that, that if there is a deviation from the norm, it has to do with the fact that women uh, can give birth at a uh, much uh, higher age than the norm. Uh, their sort of procreation career, career is longer. Um, we're st it's still subject to investigation, but from what we sort of my inclination to say, not significantly higher than the general population. And, and regarding the comparison to the Amish, it's very well taken. You know, there are both Christian and Jewish versions of what's essentially a shared separatist theology. And so there are many commonalities in terms of being dedicated to withdrawal from the world and purity and resistance to modernity. But the crucial difference is Amish and Mennonite c communities did not seek to incorporate their own municipalities or form their own public entities like school districts. One of the key points here is that this community, um, and this is sort of a central thesis of the book, plays the game of American interest group politics as well as mm -hmm. any group known. You might say that's awful, it's terrible, it's horrible. It's the game of interest group politics. Um, that is to say, they use the instrumentalities of political power, and for that matter, legal and political power, um, as well as any. Whereas the Amish would seek to sort of remove themselves from any government intervention or making use of government instruments of power. The Satmar Hassan have used those very instruments to create a community in which they can preserve their own way of life. That's a very different model than the Amish. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I think there are others, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. In co-authoring a book, there is substantial agreement and occasional disagreement. Can you tell us what was your biggest conflict? <laughs> I remember one. <laughs> there was a figure who appeared in the early records. Um, I referred briefly to some of the earliest litigation that arose um, when the followers of the widow um, initiated court proceedings trying to assert title to very valuable properties in both the city and the village. Um, and this one character, Nachman Brach, AKA Nathan Brach, seemed to be a major, major mover and shaker in the dissident movement. And according to David's sources, no one's ever heard of him. He's a nobody. He's no. I think we and, and that was a. It's an interesting example of how very you know, the story, the narrative constructed for the law it can is not necessarily what's really happening. On the other hand, what people say, people aren't necessarily the most reliable reporters themselves. I think in the end, for you know, I wanted to write about him. David said he's insignificant. But I think we established he was significant in the very early years. And then he drifted, he left the community really, um, but remained very active as indeed a big macher, mover and shaker in the real estate business in Williamsburg, where he has quite a reputation. 
just one one more question. Um, we hear you. Yep. I'm I'm one of twelve, and I grew up here over in Southside, and it seemed like everybody in our area was one twelve. <laughs> and historically, Catholics married Catholics. Irish Catholics married Irish Catholics. Now what happened, you know, when I look at it culturally here is that the more, the more apparent that um, out of town education became when people started to leave and they met other people. I have four children married to four different religions. So is there like, a, is there a method of, of not educating within the community to keep that purity? Yes, not, not educating in secular institutions. Okay. Education is taken extraordinarily seriously by all internal Jewish educational institutions. Um, we noted 7% of this community uh, graduate uh, university with a bachelor's degree. That's the antithesis of the American Jewish norm uh, and ideal of getting a university education as your point of entry into the great American mainstream. So it's the complete opposite. There's a fierce resistance, tremendous maintenance of the boundaries to prevent that exit out. Now I want to offer one caveat. Um, men are off working, women are raising children, and um, you know are no less smart or ambitious than their husbands. And we're beginning to see women really wanting more education, seeking, you know, to take online courses at uh, a local community college, which is tricky because use of the internet for reasons other than economic sustenance is looked down upon and in some instances, some, some instances really forbidden. Um, if there is going to be a significant change, to go back to the question over here, it will be women who will lead the revolution. Um, and changes certainly in Haredi communities in Israel are afoot principally led by women in this regard, who just sort of demand more, say the model of economic sustenance doesn't work, you can't have a family of 12 on one salary, um, and just the demand to satisfy curiosity and realize oneself. That's another way um, in which Curious Jones are decidedly American phenomenon, because those impulses of uh, women's fulfillment and empowerment are beginning to make their way even into this insular community. Um, and that's a really sort of important coda to our, uh, to our book, which is you know, to, to sort of understand that there's a process of what we call unwitting assimilation by a group that sets up all sorts of roadblocks and obstacles for people to, to, to exit, to go to university, to seek education, to marry out. But it's... And, and prior to marriage, <laughs> girls and boys are completely sheltered from exposure to the outside world and to one another, right? Boy, so, so it's very controlled and clearly a major uh, raison d'être for those controls is precisely to make sure no one meets and is attracted to someone outside the community. My father, okay. my father tried that too, but thank you. <laughs> so, so there was another question, set of questions from someone online um, who asked the following. Is the separatist philosophy at odds with democracy? Is the role of women confined to having children? Is it probably largely due to the men not working? Okay, and so we sort of have the answers of that. And is there any ongoing relationship between Kirish Joel and Israel, and are they sympathetic and supportive of the settlements, in particular with Curious Joel's desire for more land to expand themselves. So do you want to take on the sep democracy question, separate civil democracy? Uh, yeah, well, as the introduction emphasized, this really is a story about democracy, and that's a tricky question. As David showed on an earlier slide, the way in which this separatist community and any separatist community can create its own separate local government of, by, and for that insular group of people, all you have to do is buy and settle a piece of property. Now, not everyone has the resources to do that, but those who do, then it's the mechanisms of democracy, of local democracy that permit that conversion. It's a question of majority vote, right? You get enough votes to put a petition on the ballot, the petition's on the ballot, does a majority of residents want to incorporate or not? 
Now, we see that phenomenon more broadly, right? We talk about illiberal democracies. Many of the most illiberal authoritarian governments have been produced by election, right? So, so now you get hard questions, right? Democracy isn't reducible to elections and majority votes, but now you're going to get into some very long-winded discussions about, well, then how should we do what is a definition of democracy that's not reducible to majority vote? Yeah, I'll just say a word about the settlement question. Um, for the most part, some of Hasidic Jews are um, following the tradition of their founding Rebbe and uh, are self-declared anti-Zionists, uh, which is to say they do not uh, regard with favor uh, either uh, the state of Israel in and of itself or the settlement project. Um, my own sense is that sort of the passion of their anti-Zionism is uh, is diminishing somewhat over time as interaction between uh, ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews in Israel and uh, and the United States increases. Um, one thing we have noticed is that in Israel, um, sort of traditionally anti or non-Zionist Haredi Jews are increasingly, at some level, integrating into. Uh, into the, the life of the state, and to the point that some of them are actually settling um, across the Green Line in settlements such as Modini Elite and Beta Elite um, uh, in ways that might have seemed unimaginable a generation ago. Um, so this may be one of the ways in which uh, in which that kind of unwitting assimilation occurs in the Israeli context and. Uh, perhaps even in the American context, as Sabah Hassan Jews, Sabah Hassan become less anti-Zionism in conformity to sort of the American Jewish norm. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, what I always say is there's a lot more detail. If you're interested in finding out about it, the book is available for purchase by that side. And so thank you so much for be, your Before attention. you leave, though, uh, first of all, of course, I'm thanking you. Uh, Oh, I see a lot of lawyers in the room, and the rest of you can consider yourself law students. And um, are there any lawyers that live in Curious Joe, or do they just know how to hire lawyers? No, I mean, as David said, they shun higher education. They yeah. shun the pursuit of professional degrees. They have, it, it, this is one of the interesting things about the story. They're, are lawyers from outside the community who have become essentially in-house counsel mm -hmm. to the village, mm -hmm. to the dis dissidents. These are very, very long-term relationships, but these are um, not sovereigns themselves. <laughs> How about doctors? There are about uh, there are a couple of doctors in the community uh, who um, were doctors before they were sovereigns. Mm -hmm. They, my first encounter was uh, anybody from the community was in a hospital in New York. So they do take advantage of modern technology. Yes, they're, they're very sophisticated medical consumers, extraordinarily sophisticated medical consumers, and their uh, their volunteer uh, EMT core, known as the Hatsala, um, you know, knows exactly where people should go, be it uh, you know Mount Sinai or Johns Hopkins, uh, but. Uh, and this is not a community that shuns uh, medical uh, advancements or technology at all. Um, in another world, we talk about the reaction to COVID restrictions, which is its own story. But uh, there, I think, are a few doctors in the community, but and a very well-developed medical clinic, but uh, also a tremendous amount of lay medical knowledge. Do the women have a right to choose, like the number of children? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> um, they're, they're not, yeah, I don't, they're... It's, it's, so it's a culture of obligations, right? Organized around a sense of obligation rather than rights. And the obligation to be fruitful and multiply is one of the fundamental imperatives of the community. Now, in real life, as David said, if you want to look up, I mean, people are complicated, <laughs> right? Those are stated... I mean, that is the ethos of the community. Um, but like David said, people are people. People are different. Some people are going to devise ways of limiting yeah. reproduction. That, that's, that's what's happening in Israel amongst women. We're seeing in Haredi communities the 
uh, a decline in, in the number of children, uh, uh, largely due to women's choice. And I, I suspect that that will, that that will continue. I, it, it is important to note, though, that many women and men with whom I've spoken, um, we've spoken to a number of people, including and especially women, who left because they found it simply unbearably restrictive, all women. But the vast majority stay. And what they say, and this isn't everyone, they say what they say very often is, this is the most beautiful form of life in the world. Important to understand and hear that. This is a holistic, organic community that lives according to its principles. And women feel themselves very much a part of that. Um, and there's not, you know, there, there's not, women in the domestic sphere are, you know, are, are sort of in charge of, the operation of the house. So they do not feel in that regard disempowered. But some feel, um, as we've also heard, that you know it's not possible to sort of sustain the sustain either their sense of self or the livelihood of the family. Yeah, Could you just point out, as you do in the book, the divergence of education between the men and women? Yes. So um, oh yeah. So um, Boys are um, are given an educational diet that is almost exclusively uh, Jewish religious sources, uh, which is to say, especially after bar mitzvah age, the age of 13, very limited exposure to what we would call secular studies, including the English language, which is why it's not uncommon to encounter uh, men from Kirstall who speak very accented English, and in some case, not even functional English. Whereas girls uh, are given a healthy dose of religious uh, education, but also uh, a much more substantial um, curriculum of secular sources, including English, um, and are perfectly fluent in the English language. Um, and this is a very pronounced divide between the two, which in some sense upends right, the very assumption of men operating uh, in the public domain and women in the private, because sometimes it is women who, by virtue of their English language skills, have to be the key interlocutors with the outside world. Let me just follow on Michael's uh, question. Uh, in Brooklyn, there has been decades of litigation and efforts to regulate uh, the substance of uh, learning in the schools because of state requirements of having a, a you know a science and math and and those those sorts of things has that been um any of that happened uh in, at Curious Girl? yeah that litigation very very important question that litigation actually hasn't been going on for decades it's quite recent um the litigation we're referring to um is litigation that was initiated by young adults who grew up in various Hasidic communities, um, some in the city, some in the suburbs, some Sotmer, some other Hasidic communities, who have left the community and uh, experienced themselves as being deprived of the basic tools and the educational background. In many cases, they don't have a high school diploma. They don't qualify for many jobs. And so they formed an organization, it's called YAFED, Young Adults for Education or something like that. Um, and they, they, they learned and they discovered there are state laws that require, whether it's a, that require private schools, whether they're religious or non-religious, home schools to meet certain minimum education standards but those laws were not enforced. So the litigation, and there's also been legislative and lobbying activity, um, it, it revolves around this question of whether and how the state education department will enforce its education standards against religious what is, schools. What is called uh, substantial uh, uh, educational requirement, the substantial equivalency requirement, um, given that the curriculum is not that of a public school state educational regulators want to make sure that what that what is taught in the shivas in the uh, in the private religious system meets a minimal standard 
uh, equivalent to that which would be expected of someone um, coming out of um, you know a more regulated public public school uh, setting. What is important to note, and we haven't emphasized this point, is that the tremendous political leverage of the Haredi communities, the ability to deliver a block vote, is enormously powerful uh, constraint on policies deemed inimical to the community and a long line of politicians, not just George Pataki, who feels a particular bond of affiliation with Samar Hasidim because of their shared Hungarian roots, but Mario Cuomo as well, or Andrew Cuomo, or um, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike have been uh, closely aligned to uh, the various Haredi communities and their political demands. And so there's an interesting, in a certain sense, battle between sort of um, those who exited these communities demanding uh, full enforcement of the substantial equivalency requirement and the Haredi communities and their leadership and their political supporters on the other hand. Um, and that is what is you know, going to be playing out in the courts. And the, and the issue of, goes well beyond the any Jewish community. As you might imagine, homeschoolers and parochial school communities are siding with the Somers. And it really, we spoke about the comparison with the Amish. In 1972, the Supreme Court handed down a decision recognizing the right of Amish parents not to send their children to school at all after the eighth grade. It was a challenge to compulsory education laws, and the Supreme Court basically said, as a matter of your religious liberty, you have a right to be exempt from, from compulsory education. Justice Douglas wrote a very famous dissent in which he lamented the impact that this protection of the parents' rights would have on what he perceived as the children's rights. And he talked about um, the harm that he thought would be done to children by depriving them of ex it, what he called exposure to the new and amazing world of diversity. So there's a conflict between the child's right to access to that new and amazing or not so new, the world of diversity, and, and that question has just been left hanging for decades, for half a century. And it's only now with the emergence of organizations like Yafed that courts and legislatures are being forced to confront this question that they've done their darndest to avoid for a very long time. Yeah. Right. Has right. the special right. education right. system benefit, benefited because of all that litigation? Mm -hmm. It is remarkable. The, special, the, the, the quality of special education that is delivered to the children by the public school in Curious Joel is truly, truly exemplary. Has anyone Use the mic. Uh, has anyone within the community sought public office outside the community, and what do public officials do in political campaigning within the community? No one has sought political office outside of the community, but political officials make their way on a near daily basis to the community to seek the uh, the validation and uh, and affirmation of the uh, particularly religious leadership of Curious Joel, knowing that at least um, you know, over the long haul of this community, uh, the Rebbe's uh, uh, validation meant a very substantial block vote. Um, so uh, this is one of the ways in which sort of the door has been open to the importation of values from the host society that might otherwise not be welcome political engagement is a daily process in this community. No one has sought in this community electoral office outside. But there is a very interesting kind of parallel case with which Curious, with which Curious Joel is often confused, and that is the school board of the community of East Ramapo, New York. Um, East Ramapo is um, a school district um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the town of Ramapo. Um, uh, in Rockland County, um, which was basically um, uh, occupied by a group of Orthodox Jews. That is, say they pulled, got out the block vote, they were elected to office, notwithstanding the fact that none of uh, the school board members from this Orthodox slate had kids in 
uh, the public school district. They did so in order to guarantee that the school district provide for the private schools in the community, including the Jewish, especially the Jewish private schools, um, in ways that they deemed adequate. Part of what that meant was that the public school system was significantly defunded. So that's an example uh, that is different from Curious Joel. Right? That's where um, a slate of uh, Orthodox Jews, in a sense, took over the school board in order to divert funds to the private school district. What Curious Joel did was, in some sense, not just different, but breathtaking. They created their own municipality, and then they created their own public school, right? a different model, uh, kind of um, a model that combines all of the skill and ingenuity of interest group politics in the name of a separatist institution. Well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I have a feeling that we could name this only in America. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'll see you next week, 24th. Um, uh, Professor Logaval. Uh, will be here, and he, you'll see what he has written about, right, uh, talking about, but he's also assured me that he would be talking about Ukraine. So don't miss it. Thank you.